Praise the Lord. You know, I, I tell, we, we tell people to come and we teach them how to be in end time believers. Praise the Lord. Because it's different being a believer in our time than it was, let's say, 40 years ago. Because everything is different. The things we are coming against, the things we confront, um, the enemies that we expected to bring down, everything is different now from what it was all those years ago. So now we are supposed to come and be trained how to be an end-time believer. And I'll tell you that there's nobody better at that to do that than myself. Because I've been through the I've been through the spectrum of believing from one point to the other. When I got saved um, all those years ago, 30 something years ago, um, it, it was all about get saved and go to heaven. You know, like, so I'm saved now, I'm going to heaven. So I can't wait. The trouble is you're 19 years old and heaven is not near. So what are you going to be doing until the time you have to go? Praise the Lord. Um, so there is a bit of a dilemma there. So then now you start growing, growing in it and actually understanding what you're supposed to do. And then go through the a spectrum of it. Then when I started the Watchman ministry, um, it was all about raising awareness for the times in which we live. But I wasn't so sure what we were supposed to do about it. And I was what so many people call escapist. Oh man, things are so bad, the rapture should be, had better come so fast. Now, of course, um, that's how so many people still believe. You know, the world is getting more and more wicked every day. Things are turning upside down. Um, <laughs> you know, it looks like the forces of darkness have encircled. So now the rapture had better come. And Jesus, Jesus had, better come, had better come and take us. But then also along the way, I discovered that that's not it. We are supposed to take on these forces of darkness, praise the Lord. And we are supposed to win them. And that is how, that is the wisdom of God. To bring us to that place where we actually, those people who apparently are so powerful, are put down under our feet. And then, that's what the scripture says, that the manifold wisdom of God is displayed to the principalities. That these people, these people, you know, um, after all, everything that has been done over the years, these people can actually come and bring it down to the ground. The glory of God is manifested in us and the wisdom of God is manifested when we do that ourselves. Now, of course, there is a segment of the church which believes that God is supreme. He's going to do anything he wants. After all, he's God. He's supreme. And that's a lie. <laughs> he's not going to do anything outside of us. Praise the Lord. Because that's how he has elected it to be. Glory to God. But then, with us, he's going to do everything that we would want him to do. Glory to God. Now, and then also, we have to know that with us, when we arm ourselves to battle, and I've said this before. We cannot lose. We only lose those battles that we choose not to fight. Which for the past have been so many. But now, there is nothing that we are living and fought. Praise the Lord. Like we are ready to fight. Like we are ready. Okay, let me speak for myself. I am ready to fight. Amen? Like I don't... There is nothing in me that shies away from war and from anything that I have to do in this end time. Now, this has not been my disposition all these years. The Lord has progressively brought me from where I was also escapist. Jesus is coming. Things are becoming bad. We have to run away. My friend, we are not running anywhere <laughs> until we are on top. Praise the Lord. Then at some stage when we are on top and everybody is under our feet, yeah, then he will come and take us. But when we're on top, not under. Amen? Now, so now this is what we have to know. 
as end time believers. Now the scripture says in Hebrews 10 35 that do not cast away your confidence because it has great reward. Okay? Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Now, confidence is something which is in short supply in the church. I know that because I've been there. When people come in church, for some reason, there's a lot of timidity. And people speak when they are timid. They can't even say that I'm going to own that house. And yet, because somehow something inside them tells them that, what if you don't own it? But then what if you own it? You see, eh? you can't even speak something confidently and say, I, this is it. I am going to do this. Because there is a lot of timidity. And that timidity, by the way, for the most part is historical. And I found out that people turn out timid because of their experiences in the past. Some of them, their experiences with their parents. So you had a parent who was very, you know those sort of parents who um, your father comes home and you have to check yourself and see if everything is done. Have you done your homework? Have you cleaned the plates and what? So there is no, there is no real joy in seeing him. It's all about whether you've sorted yourself and whether you're right and whether what when he walks in, he looks around and everybody is quiet and looking for him to pick something that is wrong. And some people have grown up in homes like that. So there is no confidence in themselves. So now that sort of background bring, instills a sense of fear deep inside, deep, 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 deep inside you. So even when you come out of that situation, you, you find that it is so easy for you to fear. And anybody who tries to stab something in you, there is this deep sense of fear inside you. And it will always come out and make you check yourself. And start checking if everything is right with yourself. And it has been instilled over a period of time. Then you leave that place and you go to a school. You know those schools that, that we went to? Boarding schools. Where anything can happen. You understand? One minute you happen, the next minute you're being given chivokos for something you probably even didn't do. And then there were, you know, teachers who were sadists. You know those miserable guys who used to teach those days? Eh? Sadists, they, they derived their pleasure from inflicting pain on us. And you see the guy is having a blast by just inflicting pain on what? And then the system is in such a way that you have to just take the pain. But now because of course it's painful, there is a fear. Every time some, you know, um, you live in dread of something that is going to happen. And then you live there, and then you come to our churches. Now our churches even make it worse. Because they make it seem like God is permanently angry with you. You know those churches where somehow there is something wrong that you have done. Even when you try, there's something wrong that what? You've done. So you have to cleanse yourself. Every day you're cleansing yourself afresh. Cleansing yourself afresh. You're about to go to the cross. You understand? So now when somebody comes and says, therefore do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. There is a desire for you to be confident about certain things, but then it is negated by a deep sense of fear. Which, by the way, you have to work with the Lord to get out of you. Because I know about it. Aside from the issue of the father, my father wasn't like that. Uh, but the school was like that. From primary. You see, eh? primary boarding school. That's when you forget fatherly, fatherly and motherly love. Because you're introduced to something totally different. Man, it's harsh. I don't even know. Anyway, after having gone through that, I determined my children will never go to boarding school in primary. Man, it is miserable. Miserable. I remember when they took me to Namiriango when I was six years old. 
and I was with my parents, Namriango Junior. Apparently, they were so happy I'd been given a place in this, you know, apparently good school. My father was so excited. And also, when we started doing school shopping, I was also excited. But the excitement stopped when we arrived there. Because you arrive, and I, I saw some kids, you know, the, 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 the uniform was maroon. I think it's TDs. I went there so many years later, and um, they were still putting on maroon uniform. Maroon is almost like prison, man. Like, I don't know who chose that color. Because... <laughs> so now, I saw kids, young kids like this walking in Maroon, looking so dejected. And in my heart, I was saying that, man, be sorry, those kids. I didn't know in a few minutes I was going to be one of them. And until my parents drove out of the gate, that's when I realized I'm one of those kids. So now what happens is you become hardened. You become hard. The person who suffers is your wife. There are people who are married to... <laughs> and they, they, are, they are emotionless eh? because they were hardened by that, those conditions. You understand? So your wife is trying to be romantic and you're looking at her <laughs> and saying, but what do you want? <laughs> the, the ladies know what I'm talking about. Now, <laughs> praise the Lord. But thankfully... Confidence is learned, so is romance. Hmm? So some of us had to go to the school of what? <laughs> because confidence is learned also. But now imagine you've been through all of that, then you go to the church. Then there is not a single day when you feel, feel that you're right with God because of what you're taught. And you're taught that you're always, God is always, there's something, okay, even if you've done this and this and this. Eh? Praise the Lord. Eh? This one thing have I against you. Eh? You have done well here. You know, you've read those revelation, whatever. Eh? Eh? The church, and what you are, you've done this, and, but I have one thing against you. Eh? Now you always feel that there's something he has against you. And so now there is not a time you can actually be confident about something you state or assert. And yet, it is the most powerful thing that you can do to the kingdom of darkness. Speak with confidence. Now, if you knew how much a word spoken with confidence causes tremors in the kingdom of darkness, by I meaning a word spoken by a child of God, in confidence, you will know why the devil tries so hard to keep people into that doctrine where God is never happy with them. Praise the Lord. You see, Paul even says, you have to know this, because the, the Bible says, the righteous is as bold as a lion, but the wicked flees when no one is pursuing him. Now, in order for you to be bold, you have to know you're righteous. Otherwise, you'll be timid. If you feel you're not righteous, you'll never be bold. You will never have confidence and stand up and say, this is going to be like this. And then you will see in the kingdom of darkness, for them they speak boldly. Because the devil hasn't put on them the burden of trying to be righteous. Now here is the thing. Until you understand that you're righteous, until if the devil still has something that he can put on you to make you think, that you fall short, you will never be confident in anything. When somebody stands and speaks confidently, you will say, ah, let's wait and see. And yet actually, you're supposed to be speaking as confidently. So, somebody, so now, the key is knowing your righteousness. Now, why are people not confident? Why, I mean, aside from the reasons I've given, why, are, why, don't, why aren't children of God as confident as they should be? Why are they so timid? And I know because I was, but I am not any longer. Confidence can be learned, praise the Lord. Confidence can be what? Learned. Why are they so timid? First of all, it comes from the, whether they believe they are righteous or not. 
Now that's something you have to settle in your mind completely. That the day you received the Lord Jesus Christ, you became righteous. Amen? The righteousness God expects from you does not involve what you do or don't do. That is your own righteousness. His righteousness perfected you the day Jesus Christ died. You see, it's so difficult for people to think, to believe. You see, because of the fallen nature, you'll believe that if somebody tells you, you know you were born a sinner even before you committed any sin. Yeah, I know that. We're all born sinners. Very easy for you to believe. Why were you born a sinner? Because of Adam. Praise the Lord. But now if I tell you, you were born again righteous because of Jesus, you say, I have to work hard to be righteous. No, you didn't work hard, have to work hard to be a sinner. So you don't have to work hard to be what? Hey. If Adam made you a sinner without you participating in his sin, then why is it so difficult for you to believe that Jesus made you righteous without you participating? Praise the Lord. Is that what the Bible says? If by one man's sin, if by one man's um, disobedience, sin came into the world and death, much more by one man's obedience, you know? Uh, Romans, I think, 5.17. Anyway, let's not go there. But I want to tell you this, because it's so important for you to settle this in your mind if you are actually going to be as bold as a lion. Now, you can know it as a doctrine. I know, I know, I know where that scripture is. But do you really know it inside you? Are you confident that I'm righteous regardless of what I did last night? I'm righteous. Praise the Lord. I am what? Now, of course, um, that might be a hard gospel for some people, but because they don't believe the Bible. If they believed the Bible, it would be easy. And I've had issues. I was chased away from a church one day because of preaching, I mean teaching, uh, just re, you know, reading that scripture. Reading a scripture, they say, ah, you're giving people a license to sin. <laughs> you're giving people a license to sin. But they have been sinning without a license. <laughs> haven't they? Can any of you see here say that you haven't sinned? I mean, <laughs> but because when people say those things, those things of we are living in holiness, it is because they have constructed in their mind what is what? Their version of holiness. So they set their own exam and pass it. And they have the right to change the questions if the answers are too hard. You understand? So now, you find that um, <laughs> they, they you, you got Romans 10. Okay, I didn't really intend to read this, but Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Then he says, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Now, this is most of the church. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. You know, they are zealous for God, but they, they, they don't know what they are doing, really. Then he says, verse 3, for being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness. Now, here is the thing. They they have their own righteousness. So in their mind, you ask the Barokwari. Sinyo Amwenge, Sinyo Asigara, Sidi Muezi, righteous. According to whose standards? Your own. You understand? Hey, but if you're tempted, let's say wants to drink, then you can change the exam. I say, but it's also okay to what? But you see... <laughs> But you see from the very beginning, you are setting your own righteousness. 
Now, when you go to seventh days, they would add, don't eat pork, don't drink coffee, and pray on Sunday. Sat so rather pray on Saturday. Now, and other other things. Then when you go to some other churches where we used to pray long ago, women are not supposed to wear trousers. I remember seeing Joyce Meyer preaching in trousers. And I was like, eh, you should repent. <laughs> and they have scriptures for that rubbish. You understand? Eh? Of course, misconstrued scriptures. Now, the thing is, everyone and every culture constructs its own righteous, righteousness. For instance, here in Africa, you can, if you don't drink, you don't do what you want, you can tell all the lies from morning up to evening, like many pastors do, and it is okay. You have an orphanage which you don't have. Okay? You fleece Bazungu, but Tulimbu Tukirif. Why? Because they set their own questions. And they are answering. Their, so they, they, they set their own righteousness. And they ignored God's righteousness. Praise the Lord. Now they don't understand that God's righteousness, even the slightest sin, disqualifies you for hell. Even the slightest, like this. If we were to look at it that way. You see. You know in the Old Testament there is what they used to call a trespass offering. Now, trespass offering, you know what trespassing is? Eh? Eh. Now, if you are in, by the Spirit of God, you're supposed to be, if I'm supposed to be, let's say, not supposed to be here, by the Spirit of God, I'm going to be supposed to be somewhere and I'm here preaching. That's already a trespass offering. In the Old Testament, I would be, either I go and give a sacrifice or I would be a candidate for hell. You can't meet God's standards. <laughs> That's why he decided to meet them himself. You understand? Eh? That's why he sent Jesus. He's the only one who was everywhere. He had to be when he had to be there. You, you can't. You, you can deceive yourself all you want, but you're setting your own questions and answers. So now, when you accept the righteousness of God, that the only righteousness I'm ever, ever going to have is the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? And I get it by exchange. He got what I was supposed to get so that I can get what he was supposed to get. So I am worthy of all the good things Jesus was supposed to get because of his obedience. Now, I just want to settle that with some of you. Some of you know it, of course, because you've been here a while. But I just want to settle that with so many of you so that you can know that even if you did something which is shameful or what, you are still righteous. In other words, you are in right standing with God. You can never be sure. You can never have confidence when you don't know where you stand with God. When you are not sure. Eh. Now I, I would state this thing, but where do I stand with God? What if God has something with me? And you see there is a lot of stupidity which goes out in the church because people have failed to read the scriptures. Now seeing a, a man was, and these are, now these are top, top preachers. They were saying how to do deliverance, casting out devils. Then he said, first of all, you have to confess every known sin. Now, like, and, and I'm talking about pastors with churches of like 100, and, uh, like 50,000 people. Like, how stupid can you be? Why don't you cast out the devil in your name since you're right here? And let's see if it will go. Because I have no known sin, so Satan, in the name of Kableta, come out. Let's see if you will go. The demons go because of the name of Jesus. It has nothing to do with that. You, have it. you understand? Eh? As long as you have the legal right to use the name of Jesus, which you always have as long as you're born again, you can use it. It doesn't matter what you did or didn't do. <laughs> it is the name of Jesus. They are not listening to you. There is a hierarchy. Praise the Lord. But now if you start bringing in these other things, so you have to confess. And now I listened to that thing and I said, really? Now all these 50,000 people are listening to that garbage. It's 
since you're holy and righteous, you don't have any known sin. Cast him out in your name. Praise the Lord. Cast him and let's see if you will go. You will have my bunch. Anyhow, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now you see, the, it is exclusive. Either you accept God's sub, and submit to his righteousness, or you submit to your own. You cannot have both. Now that's what the church tries to do, having both. Okay, we accept Jesus died for us, but also you cannot do this. You also cannot do this. You cannot also do this. It's either that you're under the other righteousness or this one. Your own or his. It cannot be both. These two are mutually exclusive. You understand? Now he says, seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Now, this is the foundational teaching for every believer. Because until you believe that you're righteous, you cannot do a lot. Every time you're starting to build something, the devil will point out something that you have not done right. And you will be right. You've not done it right. But you're righteous, not because of what you do now. Let's go ahead. So he says, verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. Every law thou shalt not, thou shalt, that Christ is the end of it. The end, once Christ comes, that is the end, there is no law of righteousness. Now this is what the Bible says. Eh? Praise the Lord. You see, because when people don't believe the Bible, they start believing all sorts of things. Eh? Eh. Go to the next verse. Then he says, for Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. Now, this is the other righteousness. Okay? And he says, this is the righteousness which is of the other righteousness of, you know. And says, the man who does not, who does those things shall live by them. Now, listen. This other righteousness is about the man who does. It's about what you do. That is the righteousness of the law. Which was Old Testament, which people like a lot. Although give us, God gave us a better one. But says the man who does. You see the emphasis is on what you do. The man who does these things shall live by them. Then he goes on to say, But the righteousness which is of faith, that is the one of Jesus, speaks. The righteousness of the law does. The righteousness of faith does what? Speaks. In this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ from above, uh, down. And who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? Now, right, what does the righteousness of faith say? Not what does it do. He doesn't say anywhere, anything about to do when he's talking about the righteousness of faith. He says, what does it say? He says, the word is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which you preach. Now, the word for anything you want is in your mouth. Now, that's why he says, do not give up your confidence, which has great reward. Because you see, what people don't understand is that confidence is such a pivotal thing. In the kingdom of darkness, when somebody stands up and speaks confidently, everything starts shaking accordingly. Because there, there is something like, and, and now when, for instance, when I stand up and say I am going to be this, like I did the other day on TV. Hmm? And I told them, whether you like it or not, I'm going to be your president. Now you think they think I'm joking. You should know how the kingdom of darkness trembles. Isn't it? Because I, I, I know I speak confidently. There is, and now let me tell you, there is nothing that the kingdom of darkness starts shaking. When, because when they come against you, they come to shake your confidence. They come to find poke holes in you, cause you to fear here and there. And then you ca somehow cannot shift and then you become timid. 
And that's the only way they can win. The only way they can win. Now when I stand up and say, and speak confidently, like there is nothing, nothing, I know what those words do because I know they are coming from here and I know they are based on confidence. And I know you cannot poke any hole in me because when God sees me, he sees Jesus. So I am absolutely perfect. I am as perfect as Jesus is. That's what the scripture says. So now, even if you come and start telling me, but yeah, for you, did, who told me? I did, okay, I did. <laughs> did Jesus do it? Hey, if he didn't do it, then I'm okay. I'm ready. You see, I, I want to tell you something. Like, you have to completely believe that and make it a part of your thinking to know that your, the faith, your, uh, your, your, yours is the righteousness of faith and it speaks. Praise the Lord. So, now, the righteousness of faith speaks and says, I am going to own that house. Praise the Lord. Now, the righteousness of the law says, what are you going to do to get the money? But the righteousness of faith says, I am going to own it. The doing is not my business. Mine is to speak. Confidently, praise the Lord. To speak what? Yes, that is my... That, now, the righteousness of the Lord says, this is my car. Yeah, but where are you going? That's your business. It is my car. This is the righteousness of faith. And it speaks boldly. Praise the Lord. And now you know, um, um, you go to um, uh, Philippians chapter, what? One, verse, start from verse, Verse 27, Philippians 1, 27, says, Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, And not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of, a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. Go to the King James. Now listen, it says, you, you are not terrified by your adversaries. And when they come at you and they find you're not scared, for them it is a proof of their perdition. Perdition means destruction, anyway. And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. You see? But to you of salvation, the fact that you stand fast, People come to you and they expect you to be scared. And you're not. And guess what happens? They start, you're, you're actually pronouncing judgment on them. And that is the proof they did. You've got to amplify it. It brings it out better. It says, And in no way be alarmed or intimidated in anything by your opponents. For such constancy and fearlessness on your part is a clear sign a proof and a seal for them of their impending destruction. Don't you like that? Like all you have to do is to show I'm not scared. And then now somehow, they know that they are going down. Praise the Lord. And now they will always come at you with the intention of causing you to fear. They come at you and they, they, they have words. And remember, the article, it says the Antichrist to wear out the saints with words, pompous words. So they come with pompous words, 2030. You own nothing and be happy and all those things. Eh? Now, the only thing you have to do to show them that they are going down is not to fear. And just to look at them and say, I'm not terrified. I'm not scared. I'm not alarmed. Then now they start collecting themselves in one beat. It says... And in no way be alarmed or intimidated in anything by your opponents for such constancy and fearlessness on your part is a clear sign, a proof and a seal for them of their impending destruction. But a clear sign for you of deliverance and salvation. And that too from what? From God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Have you understood that? You've understood it. But you see, Some of, sometimes when those people come at you, 
as they do always. They have words which are venomous, which if they find you when you're not steady, you start correcting yourself. You understand? Or you start being overly cautious. Now, those are the things which actually I, 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 I always watch myself over. Not to be overly cautious of certain things. You know, there are people who would come and tell me, you know, watch what you eat, they might poison you. Then, when I'm starting to go, I say, eh, but no, this is not me. Eh? This is, uh, me, I'm fearless. You understand? Eh? Eh. Let me tell you something. If they could have poisoned me, they would have done it a long time ago. Amen? If the devil could do anything about you, he would have done it what? He can't. There is nothing he can do. <laughs> now, when you know that, you know that his power is. Eh? He looks at you with a lot of anger and venom, but there is nothing he can do. Because you bear the name of Jesus in you. Eh? So when you know how powerless he is, you know that you don't, you're not scared. I'm talking about the devil and his servants. Amen? Eh, because the devil we are talking about is not the other devil. Because you know that's what we used to think all the time. Even his servants. When they come now, now it says your opponent. So now the thing is, you tell a believer that you've gone for a job interview and you're like, 50 people like it is these days. And you arrive there and say, no matter what you guys do, this is my job. The guy will say, eh, man, ah, that is... Because they, they, are, they are not confident. They are not confident. They are not bold enough. You see, the scripture even says, even in judgment, I mean, there, there are certain scriptures which, not like that first, first, first John 4, 17. He says that we may have boldness on the day of judgment. Eh, even in judgment, you're bold. Eh? First John 4, 17. Praise the Lord. Okay, uh, we'll go back to our King, uh, New King James. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as Jesus is, so are we in this world. So you go to God for judgment and you're like Jesus. You understand, eh? So you know I'm like this, eh? Hey, there is nothing. God has absolutely nothing against you. Now, do you know when you understand that God has nothing against you? Do you know how bold you become? You start, wake up in the morning and say, you see me, I'm a servant of the Most High God. Eh? I can proclaim something and it happens. I can speak something and it's going to happen. Because I represent the Most High God. Do you understand that? Eh? And you're confident in yourself that you are, God has nothing against you. Like you, are, you represent him and you carry the name of Jesus. Now you carry it. The question is how confident are you of that? Of that fact? Praise the Lord. Uh, go to Isaiah 36. Isaiah 36, yes. Now it came to pass in the 14th year of King Hezekiah that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then, king, then the king of Assyria sent that guy with a great army from Rachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. And he stood by the aqueduct from the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. Now this is a lot of detail. Eh? Um, uh, but we will go into that someday. Eh? And Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, who was over the household, Shebna the scribe and Joash the son of Asaph, the recorder, came out to him. Now these were servants of the king of Judah, of Hezekiah. So they came out to meet the servants of the king of Assyria. Then r r that guy said to them, Say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this in which you trust? Verse 5. I say... You speak of having plans and power for war. But they are mere words. Now in whom do you trust that you may rebel against me? Now I want you to see this. By the time the king of Assyria comes to attack Judah, 
he had already attacked Israel and conquered it. Now, Israel were ten tribes. Judah was just the tribe of Judah and Benjamin. So they were like a small kingdom, very small kingdom. And he had already taken even the outskirts of Judah itself. So he arrives. And then he came with a great army. A great army because that's how the Assyrians. They would come with a great, great army. And he has come to attack Judah, a small kingdom. But you see, he will not just go and attack. He has to first speak some things because the devil does not attack unless he can strike fear in you. Now, if you're so powerful, the great king of Assyria, come and attack this kingdom. But you see, he can't. He has to first put you in a state of fear. Now, if you refuse the fear, he becomes powerless. Completely powerless. Now, that's the thing. You refuse, you refuse the fear, you refuse the fear, he becomes powerless. Like you will meet demonic spiritual entities. And the minute you're not feared, you're not scared. You see, they are dreadful. Dreadfully scared of you. They are very, very scared of you. You see, you, you realize that you carry the name. You carry Jesus in you, you see. Eh? So when they are seeing you, they know what they are seeing. You understand? Eh? Now, until they can strike fear in you, then they realize you don't know who you are. Praise the Lord. So, so go back to the previous verse. Hmm? Then, uh huh what confidence is this in which you trust? Okay? Verse 5. I say you speak of having plans and power for war, but they are mere words. Now you see, it's your words against their words. But it's not just words. If you speak them with confidence, then they carry the name of Jesus with them. Amen? So, now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Okay, go ahead. Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt, on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is the Pharaoh king of Egypt to all who trust in him. I want you to listen to these words, eh? because these are carefully selected words, and they represent exactly what, you know, when you come up against the devil and his servants, what they, the way they come and try to pierce you with words and wear you out and make you doubt who you are. Okay. So is Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, all who trust in him. Go ahead. Then he says, But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord, our God, is not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar. Now he's also trying to get into theology. And now, and even goes further, the next verse. Now therefore I urge you, Give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to put riders on them. Now, I want to say, it's like somebody who is so powerful attacks you and is negotiating because, because he's seeing something that you are not seeing, you see. Eh? Now, like a small kingdom, and now this is the Assyrian empire which had conquered, which had you know, swallowed up all the other empires before. It was the biggest empire apart from uh, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Now, and it comes to this small kingdom, and they still have to negotiate because it's not as simple as other people would say. Now, the, 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 all the Assyrian soldiers would say, let's just go and run them over. But these people know, you know the Assyrian, you know what the Assyrian is. Eh? So he says, okay, you accept, and we don't fight, and we shall give you horses, 2,000 horses, if you can put riders on them. Okay, uh -huh, go ahead. Now then, will you repel one captain of the list of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horses? In other words, he's saying, just one ca captain from our army can defeat you. Then why doesn't he come and defeat us? Why is he talking? Why are you talking? You, you imagine if somebody goes to like, you see, eh? Like, you see, now you know somebody is scared when they are promising and doing nothing. Because if somebody is going to do something, they will do it. You understand? Now you say that you are you, even one car captain here. Eh? We send just one car platoon here. They will come and sort you out. Eh? Yeah. 
But okay, let's negotiate. Does that make any sense to you? If we are that weak, why are you trying to negotiate? Anyway, um, go ahead. Have I now come up without the Lord? <laughs> now you see even this guy. You, you've seen these things. Eh? Where are people? Let's read it first. Have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now he's even saying that the God of Israel is the one who sent him to what? To destroy Israel. You've heard those things. Eh? Where are people? You stand up and speak in the name of Jesus, and people who believe in Vachuezi say, but also as we are, Jesus Christ is the Lord of Vachuezi. You know that's crap. Eh? Eh. And you see, they are trying to confuse. And it's a deliberate thing. Eh? That's no, so it's not just you who hears from God. Also as we hear from God. No, you don't. Okay? You are witches. You understand? Eh? You are witches. That's why you can't beat me. You cannot defeat me. You can't do anything to me. You understand? Eh? You can't. <laughs> you can't. You understand? Eh? You're witches. And now we have to prove between your virtuesi and Jesus Christ who is what? Who is, who is Lord? Praise the Lord. But you see they come up. Then they go to national prayer breakfast and open the Bible. Hmm? So even now, the, can you imagine the king of Assyria saying, the Lord is the one who sent me to destroy Israel. <laughs> there, is, this, this, there is something these people do. And if they can get somebody within the system of the church to speak it for them, you understand? Hmm? That is, this, this person is from God. Hmm? You're sent by God. <laughs> So that when you fight him, it's as if you're fighting who? <laughs> now this is what this man is doing. Now I'll tell you this. Forget even about me. Even yourself, everywhere you go, you're going to find adversaries. Or even just opponents. The amplified said opponents. Because you see, you're supposed to go and take over in places. So the business places... The jobs and all those things you're supposed to take away. You're going to find opponents. And don't you fool yourself that those people do not really rely on some powers somewhere. They do. And as long as you decide that you're going to win, you will win. If you decide not to fight, they will win. If you speak with confidence and let their words spoken not trouble you. You know those guys, by they can mess you up. Eh? Like they can... He can put something in your head. Hmm? Like somebody told me they went to buy land somewhere in Busoka. Now, um, so they, <clears throat> looks like the guy, they, they, there was something, the land and the guy didn't want to, you know, accept whatever the price and all sorts of things. Anyhow, so some guy comes with the witch doctor and says, eh, hey, Okay, let's see if you arrive safely. <laughs> now so many of you would be messed up by that. You would drive like this. <laughs> like, they can, he can just say something. And if you don't know he's, he's, what he's talking is rubbish, he's like the king of, of Assyria, eh? talking muawa. Eh? You actually get carried away with his words and you, you, he puts you in a place of fear. Now, if you counter and speak something about him, you will see who will fear. If you actually are confident enough and speak something about him. You see, when people understand confidence, now there they is a, uh, my brother was telling me one day there were some, some guys who went to preach the gospel in some place in, in Kenya, which has a lot of Somalis, eh? and Somalis and Muslims, some place called Isli. So they preach the gospel and what? Then they convert some Muslim guy. So the guy becomes born again and so on. So the Muslims now come and say, No, you're joking. How can you become born? Yeah, you know, how can you become born again? You know. So <laughs> the guy goes and one of the Muslim guys went and cut 
this guy who had become born again. She cut him in the hand. This is somebody who has just become born again. And the guy told him that, I will not see your face again. And they were neighbors. The guy died at night. This is somebody who got born again like yesterday. He just said, you've cut me. I am not going to see your face again. And now where you know that they know is when he said it, this guy got scared a bit. But then, of course, they put on a, ah, what are you saying, what? But you can see he's scared. Eh? You know those things. Eh? Eh, what? <laughs> and now, what happened is they started doing those things. Until even the believers, <laughs> other older believers started cautioning these guys who are preaching the gospel. And telling them, People are teaching these guys very dangerous gospel. Because they were pronouncing things. But you see what happened is that after some time, they would come and put up horn mics. You know, at the top and Then these guys come and pull them down. So one guy, after the, that guy died, guy said that, if anybody pulls down that mic, we shall see if we'll see his face. <laughs> you know, nobody pulled it down. <laughs> you know, the people they know, they, like there is a witness inside them that your God is superior. You understand? Eh? They can pretend all they want, but there is a witness that your God is what? Superior. Now, and now I'm talking about young believers who have just gotten born again. But you see, the difference is this man believed the gospel and he believed that the gospel has power. So he did not go through the, all this religious process that people go through where they, 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 they deprive the gospel of any sort of spiritual power. Anyway, have I now come up without the Lord against this land? In other words, also me, I listen to the Lord. The Assyrian king saying, the Antichrist saying that what? He also listens to God. Go back. Go back. Um, go and... Uh, uh, and the Lord said to me, now he's saying the God of Israel, said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Okay, go ahead. Then Eliakim and Shebna and Joash said to, that, uh, okay, those were the servants of Hezekiah, said to this man who was the servant of uh, Sennacherib, king of Assyria. He says, please speak to your servants in Aramaic, for we understand it. And do not speak to us in Hebrew, in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. Now, this is what you're saying, because... These are three servants of the king who went who understand the language of the Assyrians. Now the Assyrians come and they are not speaking in Aramaic, which is their language. They are speaking in Hebrew. And these servants of Hezekiah say, no, no, don't. This is between us. You speak your language. We understand it. Don't speak Hebrew. But you see, his interest is not in negotiating. His interest is in making everybody scared. So he says... So he says, and do not speak to us in the Hebrew, in the hearing of the people who are on the wall, who are listening. Go ahead. But Reb, that guy said, has my master sent me to your master and to you to speak these words and not to the, to the men who sit on the wall, who will eat and drink their own waste with you? So he's trying to spread discouragement among the army of Israel, of Judah, eh? and they are doing it on purpose. But if they are that powerful, why don't they just fight? But you see, they know. So he's speaking to that. Imagine somebody comes and first speaks to you, all your army, in your language. Yet he can, he can speak to you in a language which only you understand. But he says, no, that's this, because these guys are going to eat their waste. And they use powerful words. Now imagine, like, you're a fighter there, and you're seeing this large army. And then the guy says, these guys are going to eat. You start thinking. Eh? <laughs> it gets you thinking. Eh? It's like that guy who says, let's see if you will arrive. <laughs> you see, and now you start thinking. Now even when you, whatever, you see a, tra a trader, you remember those words. Eh? Then you go to the side like this because you're... Hmm? Go ahead. Next verse. Then uh, that guy stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said... Here are the words of the great king. Now he's talking to the people on the wall. That's all the soldiers who would fight. The king of Assyria. 
Uh -huh. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. Those are too many words for somebody who wants to fight. Huh? Okay, go ahead. No, let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying the Lord will surely deliver us. Deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Now, okay, stop there. But he goes on to say that we have destroyed so many kingdoms. And they also had gods. Then he says, where are the gods of this kingdom? Did they save them? Where are the gods of this kingdom? Now, those are kingdoms which they had actually destroyed. And he's now pointing out, where are their gods? Did they save them? We've destroyed so and so. Did his God, did, he, huh? did his God save him? Dis destroyed so and so. Then he says, don't let them deceive you that your God is going to save you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now Hezekiah had told the people, do not answer them anything. Just keep quiet. So everyone kept quiet. But what Hezekiah did is uh, he, he, he kept quiet and sent a message to Isaiah, the prophet. And Isaiah gave him a word. Then the king of Assyria wrote a letter now saying the same things and sent it to him. I want you to see how the devil operates. Eh? Praise the Lord. If, he, if you do not fear, because all this is to make you, now he's just waiting to see fear, then he attacks. Then what Hezekiah did is go to the letter and took it to the temple. And the scripture says he laid it out before the Lord in the temple and said, Lord, listen how, to this, how this man is mocking you. It is true he has destroyed all other kingdoms and other gods because they were not gods. But you are God and what? Then God says, don't worry. Mundekere. Eh? And in the night, the, an angel went and killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Now imagine a kingdom, like 185,000 soldiers, and that wasn't even half of the people who had come against Judah. But in spite of their mammoth, you know, army, they still had to talk, talk, talk. Praise the Lord. Now, you have to learn how to talk with confidence. Amen? With what? And you'll be confident when you know that you have the right standing with God. And say, you cannot defeat me. There is no way you can defeat me. You, 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 you. <laughs> You're joking. Now, you see, I, I've seen this in somebody. And it, it was just such a marvel. Does that fat boxer, what's it called? Tyson Fury. The guy is born again, but you know he has his, his things. Hmm? But he's born again. Huh? And <laughs> he says that, like I give the glory to Jesus and he gives me the victory. <laughs> that is his thing. And he, like, okay, I just love the guy. Because he was, he was the first British, what, what we do by whatever, heavyweight title ever in how long. Yeah. So the, the media come and they're interviewing him, so what do you have to say about what? He says, John 3.16, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be, uh, what, what? <laughs> then they ask him, okay, okay, we will add that. Eh? Okay, now what do you have to say? Was it, how was, how was the fight? Then he says, Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord. <laughs> he frustrated them until they just left him alone. Eh? Now the guy, what I liked about him is he met somebody who, who believed in those uh, new age things. So the guy was saying that when I get to fight, something takes me over. The other guy, the new age guy, something takes me over and I become a totally different person and I'm going to be... The Tyson Fury looked at him and laughed and laughed. And that's what you're depending on. Then you hundred percent, you cannot beat me. <laughs> he said, me, I'm depending on Jesus Christ. There is no way you can beat me. Man, I watched the fight the other new age guy was a better fighter. But he lost. <laughs> because this guy said, there is no way you can be. And you are so confident. That's what you believe in. Me, I believe in Jesus Christ. There is no way you can beat me. Now what happened is, you know what, you know in sports, at luck. Eh? So this guy hammered the guy's ear. The ear started bleeding. And you know balance of the body somehow is in the ear, isn't it? Eh? Eh. So now when somebody hammers your ear, you can't balance. And you can't box when you can't balance. 
So he knocked the guy out. <laughs> and <laughs> then they came back again. The guy said, you still believe in the other things? You still are going to lose. You cannot win. There is no way. And he's talking confidently. Very, very confidently. Now he said, do not cast away your confidence. Praise the Lord. And he won again. After being knocked down about many times. Knocked him down. They count at the count. One, two, three, four, eight. He stands up. Fights down. Eight stands up. Then he knocks the other guy out. <laughs> then he says, first of all, I want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ. He gives me the, he gives me the victory and I give him the glory. <laughs> and, that's, and that's his, those are his, and he's like, he annoyed all those guys until they stopped giving him fights. <laughs> because he would win and give the glory to Jesus. Now, I'm telling you, like, there are so many people who are so timid. So timid. They cannot stand up and say that I am speaking this because I am a servant of the Most High God. And there is no way you can win. I have to win because my God is superior to anything you can come up with. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you know what I'm saying here? Confidence. Do not cast away your confidence because it has great reward when you're not scared of anything. When you approach situations, even when they seem to be daunting, and there is a confidence inside you. Go to the next verse. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Go to the next verse. For you have, you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Now, endurance. There is a, a time when you need confidence, even when you also need endurance. Because maybe there is a bit of a contradiction. Something is not happening the way it's supposed to happen. Okay? You're being knocked down like that guy. But you need endurance. You stand up. They knock you down, you stand up. Until eventually you win. Eh? Now that's, uh, that, all of us, that's how it is. Eh? I'm not talking about boxing. I'm talking about life. Okay? Because uh, you've been knocked down, haven't you? Yes. But stand up. And be confident. Still be confident that I can't lose. Because I represent the kingdom of God. I am the whole kingdom of God. I'm the representative in this situation. Praise the Lord. Can you have the confidence to believe that? So that you go for a job interview and say, this guy is here. Now I'm here to represent the kingdom of God. So there's no way I can't get to this job. Can you have that confidence? Can you? Will you? In every scenario, you say, I'm not here on my own. I'm here to represent. And you are like David. You know, in, uh, when he speaks to the Philistine. Now, I want you to know you people. Like, you know, because you see when you people read these stories, they, they say, yeah, that's David. They don't know that he was also scared. You see, eh? But you don't, don't allow to be. You think there was no fear in him of this big guy? I want you to think about that for, a, for a, you know for a short while. Like, so you approach this guy. You you always put yourself in that place because there are so many things I know that I have done when I was dreadfully scared. But I said I'm going to do it nonetheless, and then it turns out as a testimony. Praise the Lord. And then the next time you do something similar, you're not scared because you have a reference point. I tried this the other time and it worked. So now I believe it's going to work again. Now, so he says, David comes and says, you come to me in the name of your gods. Those words are not, they are not idle. You see, eh? David just, says, he just doesn't go and fight. And the Philistine is also talking. So everybody talks. You see, the scripture says the Philistine curses him in the name of his gods. And then David, and so he's talking. Talking. And then, remember, the righteousness of faith does what? Righteousness of faith does what? Speaks. So David comes with the righteousness of faith. 
Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defined. Go ahead. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my heart. Now, these are not idle words. Eh? This is him speaking and with the COVID, and now something happens in the and now the Philistine has cast him, cast you this cast. Blah, blah. So he says, This day I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Now, all that before they fight. Praise the Lord. So now when I come up and say I'm going to be something, I'm like David. The righteousness of faith does what? Speaks. This day, you have entrenched yourself for 40 years, but me, Kablet, I'm going to remove you. And there is nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing. And by the way, I mean it 100%. There is nothing in me that doubts it. I cannot cast away my confidence. For it has great what? Somebody came and said, but you know this guy, you know what they have to do? Said, no, those are yours. Eh? I know my God. Praise the Lord. I know whom I serve. I know whose kingdom I represent. If I represent the kingdom of God, I cannot lose. Praise the Lord. I cannot what? Impossible. I cannot. And I do represent the kingdom of God. And I know God is okay with me because I have the righteousness of God. Hmm? Not my own righteousness. Amen? You have to know deep down Katonda Matira. Eh? Like when God sees you, he says, man, eh? <laughs> you guy, eh? man, you, you walk up here. Like you have to feel that because it's the truth. Then that gives you confidence. To approach these situations, knowing that God is backing me because I'm his servant. I'm not here for my own glory, praise the Lord. I'm not here representing myself. I'm here representing the kingdom of God in any area that you go. Glory to God. Every area that you go, you know that you're there representing the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Now that's how you're going to become an entire. Now, when we are through with these jokers here, then we are going for the new world order. Eh? Yeah. But we are going to start slowly, slowly. You know, Baganda say what? As if you're eating katoko, eh? <laughs> that you say, eh? What do they say? Eh? Oh, 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 Now you know, you don't start in the middle, eh? Eating katoko. Let's start with these clowns here, Amen? Yeah. Now you think that oh, they have this, they have... Oh, man, those are yours. Eh? I don't, nothing of that. Let me tell you. I settled it in my heart that my God is supreme and he is above anything. Praise the Lord. The only thing he ever wants me to do is not to back down. If I don't back down, he's right here behind me. That's true for you, eh? In any scenario. I want you to know that. In any, any scenario, as long as you do not back down. Because some of you, somebody comes, takes you a piece of life. Okay, you can choose to leave it. Okay? And you say, ah, it's not worth If you've chosen to. But they come and kuikiriza, you take your piece of land. Then they do what? And the devil is a master at that. Eh? And you think it is those people. It's the devil. So you have to say, no, no, devil, there are so many other clowns whose land you can steal. Eh? I'm not going to be in the, among that list. This is my land. Eh? But uh, this is just a castrate. It is all my land. If it ends here, you're not going to say it ends there. And then you put your foot down. Praise the Lord. And then you will you'll see how people run away. They only come because they think you're going to back down. Or other scenarios. 
Amen? Mm. Somebody comes and sees your husband. <laughs> anyway, I'm joking. <laughs> but, um, and then you say, Dave, but <laughs> you find other men to joke around with. This one you're going to what? This one you're going to joke around with. <laughs> anyway, my point is that the world is full of battles. You think, they are no, you think there's, only, there's never going to be a time when there is no battle for you to fight. And even God brings them up just to strengthen your arms. Did you know that? Huh? Let's read one more scripture, even if it's nine. Um, uh, 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 eh? yeah, uh, uh, judges. Eh? Judges. Eh? Chapter three. Judges chapter three. Now these are the nations which the Lord left that he may test Israel by them, that is, all who had not known any, any of the wars in Canaan. So God leaves people there for you to fight. Eh? Now there are some people who are sport. Like they are there, there for you to what? To fight. And God left them there for you to fight them. So that he can teach you war using them. Now this is God. This is the same God we serve. He's not any different. He has not changed. His word says, I'm the Lord, I do what? I change not. This is the same God. He did, can you imagine? He says, this one, but this one, let them stay here. So that every once in a while, you what? You flex. Eh? Sparring partners. So, uh, verse 2. This was only so that the generations of the children of Israel might be taught to know war. At least those who had not formerly known it. You see, some people think that you're going to be comfortable. You're going to be comfortable. I'm telling you, if you were comfortable, God would raise up somebody for you to spar with. Otherwise, you become useless. Uh -huh. We are built for war. Eh? <laughs> Amen? Eh, we are built for what? Eh. Okay. Um, uh, at least those who are not formally known it. Okay, go to the next verse. Namely, five of the lords of the Philistines, all the Canaanites, the Sidonians, the Hivites who dwelt in Mount Lebanon from Mount Baal, Hamon, to the entrance of Hamath. And they were left that he might test Israel by them to know whether they would obey the commandments of the Lord, which he had commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. Okay, go ahead. Thus the children of Israel dwelt among the Canaanites. Now here is where the problem comes. God gives them to you to teach you war, but you just end up settling with them. And they become a part of you. And you become a part of them. Praise the Lord. And it's possible that you, uh, you are people whom you are supposed to fight, who God had put there for you to fight, you end up joining with them, like these people. And the children of Israel do it among the Canaanites and the Hittites and among the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now here is where the problem comes. And they took their daughters to be their wives and gave their daughters to their sons, and they served their gods. Now that wasn't the purpose. People whom you are supposed to punch, and God is teaching you how to punch, and says, I'm leaving you some punching bags, and then you end up marrying their daughters. And then eventually you serve their gods. Big mistake. But I want you to know we're all made to fight. So if you think that, by the way, if you want comfort, you know, like, comfort, man, you should have asked God that you were born in 1940. Amen? Hey, there is no time for there is no comfort in this generation, this time and this time and like let me read one more scripture. One. Numbers 32, verse 6. And Moses said to the children of God and to the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? That's the end for today. <laughs> 